All the issues on the agenda, they were of critical importance to our region and to our people. More from Prime Minister Portia Simpson-Miller as we recap her contribution to the 25th Intersessional Meeting of CARICOM. So glad you could join us for another edition of Jamaica Magazine. I'm Adrian Atkinson. What else is on the show? Safety feature on vehicles. Do you know them? Stick around and find out. Samantha Allen is up next with the news of the day. But first, join the cause to build Jamaica by buying Jamaica. Nutritious food. Succulent dishes. Superior workmanship. And excellent service. Jamaica is on the go. Let's grow what we eat and eat what we grow. Let's harness the indomitable spirit of our most valued resource, our people. Let's support our local businesses. After all, buying Jamaica means building Jamaica. Good day, I'm Samantha Allen and this is your GIS News for Thursday, March 20. Jamaica is set to receive 71.4 million US dollars from the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, under the Extended Fund Facility. This now brings total disbursements under the arrangement to 345.8 million US dollars. On Wednesday, the IMF's executive board formally completed its review of Jamaica's performance for the October to December quarter of 2013. In a release, the IMF said Jamaica's program implementation had remained strong, the execution of the budget was broadly on track, but the economy remained fragile. The the multilateral agency added that government's plan to restrain expenditure to meet budget targets was commendable and said going forward, policy should also protect capital spending. The IMF mission to Jamaica conducted the third review of the country's performance between February 5 and 13 of this year. Meanwhile, one of the most critical structural benchmarks for the next review period under the IMF program was met when the House of Representatives passed the fiscal rules legislation on Tuesday. Fiscal rule tightens the management of government expenditure, debt and the budgetary deficit. To bring it into force, Parliament needed to pass amendments to the Fiscal Administration and Audit Act and the Public Bodies Management and Accountability Act. They represent a commitment that to be implemented to be passed into law before March 31st of this year. Because the international community are not convinced that we collectively have the fiscal discipline to prevent the future run-up of our debt. We need to prove them wrong. The rules alone won't guarantee, but they represent the passage of these enhancements in the legislature will at least demonstrate that we recognize that there's a problem and that we are committed to a solution. The finance minister assured members of the lower house that sanctions for breaching the fiscal rules would be set out in accompanying regulations which will be tabled early in the next fiscal year. More than 40,000 students completed day one of the grade six achievement test Thursday morning. Students wrote papers for mathematics and social studies. On Friday, they will complete the other three papers in science, language arts, and communication tasks. Education Minister Reverend Ronald Thwaite spoke with GSAT students at three corporate area schools Thursday morning and encouraged them to remain calm. He assured the youngsters that they would all be placed in good schools at the end of the process. Give thanks that all of you are going to go on to a school where you can get good secondary education. Hear me? Yes. Why are you worried, fellas? Huh? You want to make sure now that everybody concentrates and does as well as possible. Recently, Minister Thwaites revealed that plans were far advanced to revise the GSAT curriculum for the next sitting in 2015. 
Meanwhile, students and teachers at the Central Branch All Aid School in Kingston now have more comfortable and secure surroundings within which to operate. They are the latest beneficiaries of the school's equipping and fencing project, which falls under the European Union's Poverty Reduction Program, PRP2. The project is valued at $24 million, with the schools and community members contributing about $6 million of that amount. The scope of work includes the construction of five play areas complete with perimeter fencing and the provision of play equipment. Other equipment include desks, chairs, tables, filing cabinets and appliances for use in the school's tuck shops. The JCF managing director was speaking at the handing over ceremony held at the school recently. The National Security Ministry has received an ambulance that will be used to transport wounded police officers. The handing over fulfills an agreement reached in the 2010-2012 wage negotiations between the Finance Ministry and police officers. It has taken long to come, but this was one of the items that was of great importance to the police and it's going to be assigned um, to the convalescence home in St. Elizabeth uh, where our fallen um, and wounded, wounded policemen and women are recuperating. The ambulance was provided by the Ministry of Health through the National Health Fund. And finally, the former Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Youth and Culture, Sidney Bartley, has been reassigned as Director General in the Ministry of Labour and Social Security. While responding to questions in Parliament Tuesday, Portfolio Minister Lisa Hanna said the reassignment took effect on March 10 and follows a letter she received from the Office of the Children's Advocate on January 17. Minister Hanna says she wrote to the Cabinet Secretary about the letter, which outlined that the OCA had received a serious report regarding a child concerning the Permanent Secretary. I am aware that under the Child Care and Protection Act, such reports would have to be investigated. I conveyed to the Cabinet Secretary that I did not think it would be in the best interest of the Ministry for such an investigation to take place while the Permanent Secretary continued to function in the capacity as a public officer with responsibility for the portfolio which deals with the protection of children in Jamaica. And that's it for GIS News Today. I'm Samantha Allen. Thanks for watching. Colon cancer is cancer of the large bowel. The large bowel is that area of the bowel which contains the waste products. Whenever you have colon cancer, it means that those cells are growing uncontrollably. And it's something that is very serious. It is a condition which you have to diagnose early and so we can manage it appropriately. Once we diagnose colon cancer, the next step is to stage it. We want to know if it's confined to the colon or if it's outside the colon. So you're likely to have a CAT scan of the abdomen, a special x-ray, an x-ray of the chest, and some blood tests. We can use that information to decide if it's localized or if it's very involved. And that can help us to plan what your treatment is going to be. Jamaica joined a proposal by CARICOM members to incorporate the private sector within the community on trade and economic development quoted. This and other matters such as the possibility of a free trade agreement with Canada and the use of marijuana for medical and health purposes were discussed at the 25th intercessional meeting of CARICOM heads of government in St. Vincent and the Grenadines earlier this month. We have the highlights. All the issues on the agenda. They were of critical importance to our region and to our people. And I am into being involved in any discussion that can impact the lives of our people in a positive way. Prime Minister Portia Simpson-Miller, a day after the 25th intercessional meeting of CARICOM heads of government, the meeting was held in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and from all accounts, the March 9-11 to 11 summit helped to advance a series of issues that are critical to regional development. Music 
As the region forges ahead with a full implementation of a Caribbean single market and economy, Jamaica joined a proposal by CARICOM members to incorporate the private sector within the community on trade and economic development, quoted. It is important for us to understand that it is a private sector that is the engine of growth within any integration movement. There should be a, an in, industri, industrial development component within Coated and that there should be a specific area carved out within that um, community uh, organ where the private sector would, would accompany ministers of industry and those concerned with um, ICT, for example, so that the voice of the private sector can be heard. Between 65 and 90 percent of the single market has been implemented in member states. And so the eighth meeting of the Prime Ministerial Subcommittee on the CARICOM Single Market and Economy looked at the next steps to get to full implementation. Those discussions were held on March 9, a day before the opening of the 25th Intersessional Meeting of CARICOM Heads. The subjects to be discussed or reviewed for determination have one focus, that is, the improvement in the quality of life and living of the people of our CARICOM region. A broad consensus is emerging on the strategic priorities for our community in the next five years. These can be summarized as building resilience in all its forms, economic, social, environmental, and technological. Strengthening community governance for greater efficiency and effectiveness, and strengthening our sense of identity as a community. Among the issues discussed at that opening session was reparations for native genocide and slavery. Prime Minister Portia Simpson-Miller urged her regional colleagues to consider a non-confrontational approach to the issue. She said the call for reparations should involve reconciliation and dialogue free from animosity, given the history and modern consequences of slavery on the region, including Jamaica. Another matter of major importance was the historic ruling of the Caribbean Court of Justice in the case between Jamaican Shanique Myrie and the government of Barbados. Senator A.J. Nicholson provided a report for discussion by the heads of government. In 2013, the CCJ awarded Myrie $3.6 million in damages after ruling that the Barbadian government violated her right to enter the country under Article 5 of the revised Treaty of Chagaramas. At a post-intercessional meeting press conference, Barbadian Prime Minister Frunel Stewart said his country would comply with the ruling. However, Mr. Stewart said the money had not been paid over to Ms. Myrie because the parties had not settled the issue of legal costs. Usually, in these matters, um, practicing lawyers will tell you that um, when you're settling matters, you don't settle the, the, settle the damages and then haggle over the legal costs later. You try to settle all these matters at the same time so that when you close a file, it is closed. Other matters on the agenda included human resource development, the use of marijuana for medical and health purposes, the possibility of a free trade agreement with Canada, information and communications technology, and climate change. I think it is very important and it's good that it's receiving a special focus from our region. We just have to think about what happened in our region last December and uh, the impact it had on our uh, sister islands. Prime Minister Simpson Miller left the 25th Intercessional Meeting of CARICOM assured that the concerns and recommendations put forward by Jamaica would be considered in the reform process, which in turn would benefit not only the country, but all CARICOM member states. A healthy and educated people living in a clean, natural environment, reducing crime, improving the justice system and governance, building a prosperous economy. It's not just a vision, it's reality. Learn about the plan. Join the vision. My country, Jamaica, has a rich heritage and is very unique. If we all pull together, we can make it the place of choice to live, work, raise family, and to do business. 
For more information on Vision 2030, call the Planning Institute of Jamaica or visit vision2030.gov.jm, your parish library, school library, or the Jamaica Information Service. And I said, smile, smile, smile for me, Jamaica. And I said, smile, smile, oh Lord, smile for me, Jamaica. Never you cry, here am I. Yeah, I'm here for you, Jamaica. Dry your eyes, girl, smile, oh, smile for me, Jamaica. Did you know that airbags are not to be reused and that headrests are supposed to be the same height as your head? We explain why and tell you about other features in vehicles that are designed for our safety. These are a few of the features that help make the vehicles we travel in each day safe for motorists and passengers. Hi there, I'm Alison. In this edition of Road Scholars, we explain some of the passive and active safety features of the car and how they help to prevent and minimize injuries. Active safety refers to systems that helps to avoid an accident while um, passive safety refers to features that minimize the injury to occupants of a motor vehicle when it is involved in a crash. These active safety systems are the steering and the braking of the motor vehicle that are operated by the driver while the passive safety features are like the airbag and seatbelt that is activated by the vehicle itself when it is involved in a crash. And speaking of a crash, it is important to buckle up at all times because not only does a seatbelt save lives, but it helps to prevent lifetime and long-term injuries. It's very important to wear the seatbelt. In case of an accident, the seatbelt will keep you from going forward. In case of sudden impact, you don't, uh, I mean, fly from the seat or from the vehicle, so it keeps you stabilized. And if you don't wear the seatbelt, you can be persecuted. So it's very important to drivers to always wear a seatbelt because it saves life. Under the Road Traffic Act, you can be fined $500 and two points if you are caught driving without wearing a seatbelt. The same fine applies if your vehicle is not fitted with seatbelts. And then there's a penalty of $800 for not ensuring the safety of your passengers. Persons must remember that the seat belts are installed in the vehicle as a safety device to minimize the injury that you might receive in the event of a collision. So persons who are wearing the seat belt in this fashion, right, this is not the correct way. The seat belt must be worn right across your shoulder. If the seat belt is too high, based on your height, then it can be adjusted to fit right across your shoulder. And if you are a tall person, it can also be adjusted so that it fits you as best as possible for your own safety. Children are precious, and their safety must be taken into consideration when traveling in a motor vehicle. So if they are too small, a child or booster seat must be used. This is recommended for children under the age of seven. You should also make sure that it is firmly fitted in the vehicle, allowing for minimal forward or sideways movement. Let us use these safety devices to help protect our children from death and serious injuries in road crashes. The purpose of the address is to um, support the the neck and uh, the head and in case of an accident you, 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 your head would be going back way. I think we are whiplash is concerned it protect give you protection from that also. It don't make your neck strain or it, it hurts it just relaxable it's more comfortable so you can't enter it on the street more. The headrest is sometimes mistaken for a luxury feature 
but it is actually another valuable safety feature on your vehicle. The headrest or head restraint is actually to minimize or prevent a whiplash injury during a collision. It should be adjusted to the height of the driver and passenger's head and there should be at least two inches between your head and the headrest. This is the highest this particular headrest can be extended. So this will be okay. So in the event of a crash and the vehicle is stopped suddenly on impact, the seat belt will restrict your forward movement and the headrest will restrict the backward movement to avoid any whiplash injury. During a collision, the airbag acts as a cushion that minimize or prevent injury. What the airbag does is to reduce the speed of the forward movement of the occupant. The airbag is designed to inflate rapidly in moderate to severe crashes and provide protection to the occupant's bodies when they strike interior objects such as a steering wheel or a window. However, for proper protection, persons should be correctly restrained with a seat belt. During a collision, an impact with an object at a speed as low as between 16 and 24 kilometers per hour. The airbag inflation system acts on two gases, sodium azide and potassium nitrate, which produces a nitrogen gas that inflates the airbag and suddenly deflates the airbag within a second on contact with the occupant. Most vehicles carry two airbags to the front, one in the steering wheel and the other on the dashboard on the passenger side. But in high-end vehicles, you will find up to eight airbags at various locations to the front, rear, and even to the sides. Airbags were designed for one use only, and therefore, once it has been deployed, you must have new ones installed. Reusing airbags is a dangerous practice. You've often heard it said that children should travel in the back of the vehicle, and here's one of the reasons. It is because they are too small to handle the impact of the airbag, so take these tips into consideration. You should never put a rear-facing child seat in the front seat of a car with an airbag, but make sure all children are buckled up no matter where they sit. Unbuckled children can be hurt or killed by an airbag. The next time you buy, drive, or travel in a motor vehicle, remember, they offer more than just flashy features for your mobility and enjoyment. They are also built with protective safety devices, so take time to know them. Buckle up when you drive, protect your children with child and booster seats, and strap them down well. Adjust your headrest and never reuse an airbag. This has been Road Scholars. Until next time, take care. Know your numbers and control the keys to a healthier heart. Know the numbers for your blood pressure, cholesterol level, blood glucose level, and your weight and body mass index. Find out the risks they represent and what you need to do to stay healthy. Talk to your doctor and start making healthy lifestyle choices to prevent a heart attack or stroke. When was the last time you heard a good old-time story? Today, we have a special, you know, 25% um, discount for, for 65. Yeah, I say I am um, 70. <laughs> Storytelling has been with us from the days of slavery, when slaves used it as a means of entertainment, passing on their respective group's history, and even as a way of conveying secret information, which at times the slave masters thought were innocent stories. Later on, long before television came to most Jamaican homes and local radio was almost non-existent, 
parents, grandparents, and even siblings continue to the tradition by telling each other stories, primarily as a means of entertainment, which also inadvertently helped to secure key historical information about the Jamaican and Caribbean people. I do believe it began with the family. We did have um, television, and I grew up without even radio. At us, whereas before, I, when I was a little girl, radio came in. And, you know, I remember I acted as Little Red Riding Hood on ZQI or something like that. But um, so we had to sit and talk to each other, and we had to entertain each other. And I think that's where it started. And I have looked at, I've looked a bit at this here in Jamaica and in some other parts of Western Africa. And I noticed the same thing, where the older people are sitting with the younger people and other older people people of different ages in the community and there's a time for sitting down and sharing and telling the stories and you notice the involvement involving everybody in the story cultural icon dr the honorable louise bennett miss lou has been instrumental in keeping the tradition alive with her unique style of telling anansi stories riddles and much more since then, other talented Jamaicans such as Amina Blackwood Meeks, Charles Hyatt, Leif Nelson, Joan Andrea Hutchinson and many more have followed in Miss Lou's footsteps in helping to preserve this important aspect of our culture by telling stories at special events or in some cases even at their homes. You didn't know, so you have a cubbage hole. So you don't have no cubbage hole. Everybody have a cubbage hole. Bend over your head. Feeling your neck back, right in the center. You feel a little hole? Well, that is your cubbage hole. And if you're very deep, you know, so you're very cubbage. If you're not so deep, then you're not so cubbage. But you're not behoved if you're cubbage at all. Oh, oh, right. But have we done enough to keep the tradition of storytelling alive? There's hunger for this, and um, because if we listen to what's happening in the society today, it's like we're losing our culture, and we need to tell the little ones, right? You know, something about where we're coming from. Before them could answer, but I said, You know, I have a feeling you better go and tap a brother. I'm busy, busy, busy. When they keep coming, it is important because um, it teaches you the art of listening. And we, we, we're today, we're so rushed and busy. We, we hear, but we don't listen. Storytelling teaches you to listen, and if you listen carefully, you can relate and you can take it to another level. So children and parents alike listened with wide-eyed interest as storytellers brought the stories alive with songs and animated gestures in front of the magical gingerbread house. You too can do your part in keeping the Jamaican culture alive. What's your story? They went to Patos, but English, they never know poor thing. They wouldn't tell Nancy's story, and folk song they couldn't see. But at the jackass with the long tail, bag of coke coming down, and the peel it jam from country tap just made them head spin wrong. Why not tell one to a child, a relative, or even a group of friends today? That's how we end our show for today. Join us again tomorrow, same time, same station. In the meantime, there's more information on our website, jis.gov.jm, and on Twitter at JIS News. If you've got ideas for future programs, send them to Jamaica Magazine at jis.gov.jm. On behalf of the entire production team here at the JIS, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Walk good. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.